Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today is Saturday, April the 18th. It is a beautiful day here in Salt Lake City, Utah. I hope it is beautiful wherever you are dialing in from today as well. Today wraps up an absolutely incredible Meet ASEA Blitz Week. I want to thank each and every one of you who has joined us this week for this incredible message, this opportunity that we have taken in this virtual world that we are living in right now to bring you the mission, vision, values, ethos, and legacy opportunity that ASEA represents. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you are rejoining us, welcome back. My name is Karen Riley, and I am joined today by an incredible human being, our founder, Tyler Norton, and he is going to be sharing with you today the ASEA ethos. It's the distinguishing spirit of a people and a culture. I know that for years, as we have been teaching this message, it has made an impact around the world. Regardless of the language you speak, the country that you live in, the distinguishing spirit of ASEA is alive and well today. Um, these are unprecedented times, and again, I will share the, the word that comes to mind each day this week as we have gathered together in the thousands has been resilience. So there's a lot of information for you to hear today, potentially transforming your life. So I'm going to get this call turned over to our founder, Tyler Norton. Ty, thanks so much for being with us. There he is, there, and now I can see you and hear you. You hear me okay? I can. Good morning, Ty, how are you? I'm so good, how are you doing? I am so excited. This has been such a fabulous week. We've had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of associates and non-associates and customers and family and friends joining us to learn more about who we are as a company, how we got started, of course, kicking off the week with you on Tuesday with the Genesis story, and then the very next night with our, our, uh, with our CEO, Chuck. Um, <laughs> Chuck, in your honor today, I'm wearing glasses. Uh, for those of you who are on the call, that would make sense. And then on Thursday night, we had an incredible opportunity to hear from our president, Jeremy Webb. Uh, he shared just an absolutely perfect perspective of where we are today as an organization most importantly where we are going where this company is headed and then friday night i was joined by terry latham and ed weens and dr maureen hayes and we talked about what kind of uh, a world that we're living in today how people can get involved with the SIA using this as a vehicle to meet all of their needs whether they were um, financial needs or health needs um, the whole premise behind our Friday night call, Tyler, was, um, you know, we're all thinking about our health, our immunity health right now, but Friday night was all about our income immunity. So it was really, really powerful, and I appreciate everyone joining me last night for that call. And then, of course, today we're wrapping it up with this incredible opportunity to hear from you um, as you share the ethos of the company. So I want to thank you for spending your time with us today. I'm so excited for the people who are on this call and what they are about to learn. So take it away. Oh, thanks, Karen. Thanks. We sure appreciate your leadership. What a great week you've led here in trying circumstances. So thanks for all you do. Karen, okay. in a few minutes, I'm going to show a little video. Will you make sure you let me know if you can't hear the audio on that video? I will, absolutely. Make sure we don't run into any, any AV problems this morning. We, Chuck and I know all about AV problems, so we're, we're a whiz at this now. <laughs> I can only imagine. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, guys. Give me just one second here and uh, see if I can launch this for you guys real quick. Karen, are you able to see my screen okay? Yep, it looks perfect. Awesome. Okay, cool. Guys, what a treat. It's great to be with you all here today. Um, I feel so uh, fortunate to uh, be able to work at this great company at this time. I want to launch my screen one more time, see if this works. Okay, I think that should have it there. Looks great, Ty. Great, thanks. Um, what a treat for me to be with all of you guys today. I'm amazed on a Saturday that uh, I could fool you into coming and joining us to talk about some of these principles and concepts today. Uh, I really, really am flattered and humbled that you'd spend some time here today. For those of you that might be streaming live via Facebook, welcome. Uh, and to those of you that might be watching this on a later uh, opportunity as a recording, Thanks a lot for taking the time to do this. Um, what a great week that Karen and her team have hosted 
for us to be able to share more about what we're doing here at ASEA and what it all represents. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to participate along the way in the different uh, sessions that they've done, uh, the Genesis, and of course our mission and vision as a company. Uh, I, I have heard wonderful things. I went back and watched Jerem's presentation uh, on, I think it was Thursday night, and what a wonderful job he did. So thankful for our field leadership that presented last night and the notion of income immunity is really relevant. Um, just this morning, by the way, I was looking at an article from the Federal Reserve Bank president who was saying, hey, we're in for some tough sledding here for the next little while. And uh, it's not just the virus that's gonna be a challenge. We all know that people are going to be struggling to find ways to keep up economically, not only uh, to stay healthy, but also to stay financially healthy. So I can't think of a better way to position that than to speak of it as income immunity. It's an important thing that's gonna be uh, even more important as we move forward. Uh, we're celebrating 10 years this year. It's been a tricky 2020 already. Uh, none of us could have imagined some of the disruptions and changes that would be happening around us. Um, it's a fascinating time to be alive and one that certainly requires us to be resilient and also to be flexible and abil have the ability to adapt. And of course, this whole week was an attempt to recreate, if we could, some part of what would have been our North American Envision event in Texas which we were very, very sad to, to have to cancel altogether because of the world health situation, but certainly felt like it was the right thing to do. What a wonderful blessing it is to have access to technology that enables us to communicate this way and to gather as a teams and also invite new people who may for the first time be hearing a little bit about ASEA uh, at such a unique time and point in history, certainly in our lives. And so for those of you that are here for the first time, thanks for coming, especially on a Saturday and giving us a chance to share a little bit more about who we are as a company. Um, you know, we've been uh, sharing concepts for a lot of years that we refer to as the ASEA ethos. And we've been teaching this ethos at what we call ASEA Ethos Academy. Um, this is a gathering that we've done in Europe, all throughout Australia. We were just getting ready to do this into Asia. This year, we would have been there last week doing some of these things. Um, and certainly we've been teaching a lot of these principles over the last 10 years here in the United States and across North America. And it's really been an attempt for us to step back and remind ourselves of some core principles that underpin what it is that we believe as an organization. And it's not so much just us professing a disposition or an attitude that we have, but also an invitation. Uh, for all of us to consider the way that we might be uh, representing ourselves and this great company, and also something that might be able to enrich and healthy and, and, and provide health in our family relationships and in the key relationships in our lives that mean so much to us. And so um, to give you some context on what this academy has been all about, um, you know, when we, uh, when we, early on started talking, let me back that up one step. step. So I, I was once in a meeting with a gentleman that um, was the former chairman of the board of one of my prior companies. And um, he introduced this concept to me where he started to question the word corporation and where it comes from. And the etymological deriv derivative of corporation is, is corporeal or corpse or body. So it actually means in a body. We use these interesting lexicons in business where we're often referring to entities using this kind of language. So corp corporations are a body. Think about the word organizations where we reference uh, organs in, inside of an organization. It's kind of an interesting connection back to the physical body. And um, it's an interesting question that this gentleman posed to me which was, so if a corporation is a body, um, is it possible then that it can have a soul? Really interesting question. And uh, in this particular instance, it was an, a life insurance company I was working for, and he said, uh, the soul of this corporation uh, began with uh, the founder who over a hundred years ago would sit under his mother's sewing machine, which was uh, powered by her uh, foot moving back and forth on a lever that would then turn the actual wheel on the, and then ultimately the needle. And uh, her husband had passed away prematurely and left her both a widow and uh, with these little children that she had to provide for. 
and uh, her little boy would get underneath the sewing machine and with his hands would do push the uh, the lever there that would then turn the the wheel and ultimately drive the sewing machine when her ankles and legs were getting sore from doing it all day and um, he was telling us this story and he said that's the soul of the corporation that's where it started was to protect the widow and the orphan and i never forgot that concept that a corporation really is a body um, and I believe that it can and should have a soul. Uh, one question I've posed as I've taught this academy around the world is, do you believe that corporations can have a soul? And uh, you know what's been interesting is the unanimous resounding response has been yes. If I open it up to the group, whether it's 100 people or 1,000 people, they all say yes. I quickly then and subsequently ask, do most corporations have a soul? And the answer is just as quickly uh, given, the answer is no. And that's an interesting question. So what is it about corporations over time that either they lose their soul, maybe never really engender or build a soul? Uh, and it's a fair question, right? Now let's take a look at the concept of soul, right? Um, if you were to look up a definition of what soul is. It's kind of a, a slippery thing to try to define, but this is a simple definition I've found. This is a dictionary definition. It's the spiritual part of a person that is in fact believed to give life to the body. So the spiritual part of a person that's believed to give life to their body. So using that definition and merging it to the concept of a corporation, is it possible that a corporate soul is the spiritual part of an organization that is believed to give life to the body or the corporation, in the sense the body being the entire entity? And the whole essence of what I wanna talk about today are some principles that I think are windows into the corporate soul of ASEA. And we often refer to this corporate soul as our ethos. Now, ethos is a beautiful word. It's rarely used in, in, in definitely rarely used in business settings. We've been using it very aggressively for 10 years as a way to build upon our core values and maybe give greater life to them. And just by way of explanation, ethos, which is defined as the distinguishing or differentiating spirit of a given culture, if you thought about culture as a circle, and then the very, very center of that circle is the most defining or distinguishing spirit of that culture, that would be your ethos. And to me, I believe of, I think of ethos as the corporate soul. Um, if you study anthropology and different cultures around the world, you'll hear this word ethos emerge a lot in the various writings of different anthropologists who say the ethos of a given culture is embodied in these things. For example, the ethos of the American culture has long been the American dream, which suggests that uh, we're on equal footing enough that with hard work and with given the right opportunities that anyone can build a life for themselves here. That ethos, of course, has been challenged and questioned over the years and more so recently. Um, but at any given time, that ethos is given an opportunity to emerge. I think there is an ethos of unity in the United States. It's in the very name of our country in the, the concept of being united. And it's been interesting when we're faced with a collective challenge, one that may not have necessarily been inside our control, this ethos of unity starts to emerge as well. A lot of the governors that I've listened to, New York, California, here in, in Utah, where we are now, are saying we're in this together. Those are good moments to kind of see that's the ethos that's prevailing at a given time. That's the character or spirit of this culture. So what we'd like to do today uh, is maybe share some insights with you that have emerged over time that we believe represent our, our kind of characterizations of that spirit or soul that is our ethos as a company. By way of backstory, um, to be fair, the, the ASEA ethos didn't just kind of happen in one moment. It's actually a set of presentations that I had given since the early days of the company. So. Uh, each of these screenshots are actually from presentations that we had made, each of which had an element to them that we thought both should be and we would like to be representative of our distinguishing spirit and the character of our culture as a company. 
And I want to be clear, Chuck shared earlier this week the mission, vision, and values. Our core values, our corporate values are very much at the center of this ethos. But these presentations were just different dimensional looks at what we wanted that spirit and culture to look like and feel like. And in the interest of time today, I'm just going to focus on these four. Uh, we just don't have enough time to go deep on all of them. But I thought I would share uh, the, the top one here is what we call EPC, and I'll take you through these in some detail. Uh, the one to the bottom right on your screen is our Believe, Belong, Become, the great maxim of ASEA. Um, the uh, one that's at seven o'clock, if you will, clockwise, is the three questions, a beautiful children's story that has a wonderful message that we've always felt was very much at the heart of who we are as a company. And I'd like to end uh, uh, pivoting to Ubuntu, which is a beautiful uh, South African, ge general African philosophy in the Southern parts of Africa that really embodies something that I hope we can embody as we go out and try to do the best we can to not only share what a C is all about, but maybe try to make our lives a little happier and, and, and a little more meaningful. And so looked at linearly, th these are all the different elements uh, and compositions of that ethos. And again, I'm just highlighting the four that I'll be walking you guys through today using this framework. So um, if you were to start with this formula, this was the very first part of our ethos, our corporate soul that we wanted to share with people. It's a bit of a play on words. It's not a mathematical equation. It's actually just a formula that we, we like to think of as the very formula that can determine our cultures and, and companies' success. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a beautiful concept if you allow it to sink in for a minute. And let me give you a little context on where this came from. Uh, when I was in the insurance and investment industry, it was not uncommon for me to recognize and see uh, top producers that would do great, great numbers in productivity or volume with our company. And, and I, I started to see some interesting patterns. And that was that some of those top producers would be on very, very top of the mountain, so to speak, in a given year. And within a year to two years might be out of the business. They might have been fined or censured by a regulatory body. And even in some cases, uh, there was one or two cases where they had gone to jail. And I remember saying to myself, I was sitting in a meeting and I started to process and say, what is it about these top producers sometimes, not all of them, by the way, but some of them would get so intoxicated by the recognition and being in front of everyone and vowing to take the laurel, so to speak. And then sometimes I'd find myself at these award bank banquets sitting at the back or in the middle of the room as a younger sales manager or even as a, an officer of the company. And I'd be sitting next to a veteran that was 20 or 25 or 28 years in the industry I was in, very successful in his own right or her own right. But these folks were the kind of people that maybe never took the stage in first place. And I started to really double click in and say, so what is it that makes these different people tick? And what started to emerge was a formula that was a relationship across three things, where I was seeing that somebody's motivation and commitment as measured on this y-axis uh, schematic here, towards ego and economics I was seeing was was relevant these are the these are the folks that had a real economic drive and financial motivation coupled with maybe a real heavy sense of ego and wanting to be recognized and uh, so to so to speak maybe needing a little bit more attention than the other and I started to kind of place these folks on a graph from like zero to nine and I said this is interesting let me give you an example if I were to graph it for you so I said okay what if someone has an ego and economic commitment? Um, that's why we call it E squared. That's, that's, that's not a 10, it's not a nine. Remember, I'm measuring from zero to nine on the Y axis, but there are five. It, it, I wondered, is this good or is this bad? And the answer was, I don't really know yet until I have a better sense of what their commitment is to principles. Let's talk about principles for a minute. And my favorite definition of principles is concentrated truth that has been packaged for a wide variety of application. Now think about that for a minute, concentrated truth. I remember one time teaching this to my kids, I have six children, and I used concentrated orange juice as the reference point. I said, what if truth could be concentrated? If truth can be concentrated, then I would call that a principle. 
And the reason it's so concentrated is because it's relevant in a wide variety of circumstances. So if you said integrity or let's use honesty, which is one that always emerges in the early discussions about this, is honesty a principle? In other words, is honesty a concentrated truth? Of course, right? Can it be packaged for application to a wide variety of circumstances? Yes, for example, does honesty matter in my marriage? Yes, does honesty matter in my business? Yes, does honesty matter in my community? Yes, I mean, you could go across a broad range of circumstances and say, this concentrated truth of honesty applies. Well, honesty, of course, is not the only concentrated truth. We have hosts of them, uh, civility, kindness, humility, service, work, hard work, uh, diligence or discipline. I mean, we could go through and start listing out, does discipline apply to success in various areas of life? And the answer is yes. And so I, I like to look for individuals and certainly like to manage myself by saying, am I being more motivated right now by my own ego and economic drive, my motivation for money, my commitment to money, my motivation to gratifying my own sense of self and wanting to aggrandize myself? Or am I making a decision or acting motivated by principles or truths that I can then take to the bank and know that over the long run will lead to success? I like to think about success as durable in the sense of enduring or long lasting. And what I found by watching those top producers is a lot of them maybe reached a certain measure of success, but it wasn't durable. And if you look, it said, if what happens when a person keeps E under P with this less than sign, focuses on keeping ego and economic motivations and commitments beneath someone's motivation and commitment to concentrated truth and principles like, like hard work, civility, kindness, uh, and all of those wonderful principles. Now, you can imagine that, that sometimes any one of us don't keep this E squared under P. This great mantra of keeping your ego and economic motivations under principal commitments. And I think about it, we call this the EP ratio. We also refer to this as a motive management because if your motives are really centric on yourself and the economics, I believe you're not gonna have long-term or durable success. You may make this stage one time or two times, but like I mentioned earlier, there were sure a lot of people I knew of that, uh, that actually Chuck Funky and I worked with several of them that, that placed E way above principles and really got themselves not only in trouble in the industry, but some cases all the way to the extremes of getting in trouble with the law. Whereas there were people that were quiet, good, principle-based players that had very successful and durable careers, um, but they had just learned to manage their motives and not get them out of whack. You can imagine, right? I mean, on any given day, uh, this can happen to all of us. We can have moments when the ego motivations and excitements or commitments can start to climb. Uh, I was a financial advisor that did a lot of estate planning. I saw lots of families get tangled in E over P moments where mom and dad might have had a large estate, they passed away, and I would sit in the room as, as brothers and sisters that probably had great love for each other prior started to, you could feel this principle started to decline and ego and economic drives and desire started to, to kind of take over. And this can happen to any one of us. I think we need to be careful to not only see this as a diagnostic tool for others, which I think can be risky, the better use of this tool is as a diagnostic tool to ourselves. I often say, uh, be careful to not use our ethos as a sword you should use our ethos as a mirror. You should be using it to kind of get a feel for where we are right now and how we might be able to course correct. And so this of course would be a dangerous dynamic where E is greater than P or E over P and can be tricky. And you know, I was thinking about this and I thought I'm gonna share one of my favorite examples of managing ego and economics commitments under principles. And Karen, this is where I wanna make sure uh, you can hear my video okay. It's just a small video clip from an old movie that I watched as a little boy that I, I've never forgotten. And uh, Karen, if I don't hear from you, I'll just know that the audio seems to be coming across and I'm gonna reach up and make sure my volume's all the way up. I believe it can just capture this audio right through the Zoom. So here's my one of my favorite examples in a movie 
of a moment where you could see that the power play between uh, E and P uh, manifesting itself. It's kind of an old movie. Walker, I'm extraordinarily busy today. I just wanted to ask about the chocolate. There's a lifetime supply of chocolate for Charlie. Well, when does he get it? He doesn't. Why not? Because he broke the rules. What rules? We didn't see any rules, did we, Charlie? Wrong, sir. Wrong. Under Section 37B of the contract signed by him, it states quite clearly that all offers shall become null and void if. And you can read it for yourself in his photocratic copy. I, the undersigned, shall forfeit all rights, privileges, and licenses herein and herein contained, etc., etc. Fact, mendip, incendium, gloria, copum, etc., etc. Memo, bis, punitive, gather, copum. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You stole busy listening drink. You bumped into the ceiling, which now has to be washed and sterilized, so you get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. You're a cook. You're a king and a swindler. That's what you are. How can you do a thing like this? Build up a little boy's hopes and then pass all his dreams to pieces. You're an inhuman monster. I said good day. Charlie. You won! You did it! You did it! I knew you would! I just knew you would! Oh, Charlie. Forgive me for putting you through this. Please forgive me. Come in, Mr. Wilkinson. Charlie, meet Mr. Wilkinson. Pleasure. Like no, no, that's not Slugwood. He works for me. And you? I have to trust you, Charlie. And you can't the shot. You won! What was the jackpot, my sister? The grand and grand jackpot. What? The jackpot, but that's just the So, uh, what a beautiful scene. You guys remember this friend. This is Charlie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, uh, one of the great Raw Doll books. As a little boy, I remember very distinctly reading James and the Giant Peach and all of the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory series. It was a big part of my elementary school years. And um, this movie, of course, would have been when I was about that same age. And so um, what is it about that moment? And if you stop and really think about what's going on, aside from the humor where everything in the room is cut in half and he's even writing a note in half, um, What's really happening here? It's it's interesting. Do you remember what it was that Charlie gave back? You guys remember what that was? It's it's the it's the everlasting gobstopper, and it it's a piece of candy that will never ever dissolve or run out. And if you stop and think about it, of all the boys on the planet, the way uh, Charlie's life is portrayed, not only in the movie but even more so in the book. Here's a boy who comes home to cabbage soup or onion soup or something every night to, to very poor parents and grandparents all uh, bunking in a single room, in many cases in a single bed. And this opportunity to have a piece of candy that will never, ever run out. And uh, it's an interesting concept to think about because uh, in some ways, I like to think of it this way, which is you know, what's your everla everlasting gobstopper? 
Is there something in your pocket that this, your career, your personal life or otherwise that you wouldn't give back uh, if it was the right thing to do? And I think we live in a world, there is a book written by a guy named David Callahan that called The Cheating Culture. And it talked about how cheating and taking advantage, if you could get away with it, was of course the, the thing to do. And it was, it was almost swallowing the American ethos uh, in many regards. And I like to sit and reflect in that movie about the incredible message that is sent in the whole process of being tested. What if we were always being tested to see if we would place principles above our own self-motivations and self-interests? Uh, what if each moment was in fact a test? And of course, we know that Charlie's grandpa, who is walking him out, uh, or I'm pretty sure that was his grand, yeah, it was his grandpa, and he's walking out and he says, boy, I'll get even with this guy if it's the last thing I do. And he says, if Slugworth wants an everlasting gobstopper, that was supposedly the competitor to Willy Wonka, well, that's what he's going to get. And in this particular moment, you see the beauty and the simplicity of a little boy who returns and gives back the gobstopper and says, you know, I just don't feel right about this and places principles over ego and economic motivations. Now, I want to be clear. I am not the poster child for doing this. I'm simply saying I'd like to think that all of us could learn from that simple maxim of what does it mean to keep E under P? Is it to make the ascent trip or to qualify for the diamond uh, retreat, the sun and sand retreat? Is it to make a rank before a major recognition event uh, where we start to see the economic and ego motivations maybe start to call into question the principles? Is it us as a company seeing a moment when we might be able to do something that would increase the profits of the company at your expense or someone else's expense? Is it as simple as my wife reminding me when I'm driving down the road and needing to get in front of a car in front of me that I'm having an E over P moment? I mean, this stuff happens like your blood pressure changing, which changes very quickly and very easily. And I just think that's a beautiful story of a little boy making a decision that he felt was right. But then what's so beautiful is, of course, in that moment, Willy Wonka turns around and says, you won. You just won it all. You won by giving back the thing you wanted more than anything else. I'm going to give you all that I have. It's such a beautiful concept. And then, of course, Grandpa says the chocolate. And he says, yes, the chocolate, but so much more. And he becomes the great successor to the Willy Wonka a candy uh, empire. And I, I think it's something we ought to consider carefully at times is the best decisions I've ever made in my life. And let me take you on a little detour. Even the the opportunity to be associated with a C and all of you would not have happened if at prior times in my life I hadn't made decisions more on principles than ego and economics. I had an opportunity to take a job here in Salt Lake City at notably less compensation at the time. I was in my early 30s and it didn't make a lot of economic sense. And I sat down and made a list of all the principles that would underscore the reason for the move. And I was living at the time in Arizona, and my parents had retired to Park City, Utah. And I remember writing down proximity to my parents, proximity to my siblings, a series of other core principles. My wife, Allison's parents were here. And I started to list all of them out, and the principles indicated to me that this was the right choice. And so I walked away from a fairly significant differential in compensation at a very young age to take a job with a smaller company. And I met the individual that introduced dad and I to the technology of ASEA through that choice. I, if I had not made that decision, then other things wouldn't have happened. And I, I think we can all look back on our lives and see the moments when we've had P or principles be our primary decision criterion and come away saying those were the better decisions. We live in a world that tries to promote the opposite and make it that simple. And I'm learning that durable success across a broad range of dimensions in life really is a function of how often you choose things based on principles versus ego and economics. So keep that in mind and remember the great story of the everlasting gobstopper. I think it's highly instructive for all of us. I like to think of the target score across these three dimensions 
as being like a 58 between ego and economic and principles. You might say, well, why should it be a five? Oh, well, I, I think it's important that you have an economic drive. I think it's very important that you have a healthy sense of self. And I don't necessarily do well working with people that aren't economically motivated at all and or that don't really have any sense of ego about who they are. I just don't think it's healthy for people to make that greater than their commitment to principles. And as you might imagine, the third dimension of this capacity, I would also want to be high because capacity is all about actual or potential ability. So capacity in this formula says, not only should you have the right motives, your heart should be in the right place, you should also be working on bettering yourselves, getting better at what you do and how you do it. I like to think of capacity, not unlike a, a bottle of water here that might be a 16 fluid ounce bottle of water that only has one ounce in it, the capacity is still 16 fluid ounces, even though the actual water in it is less. And I like to think of people that way. Every person you meet has the potential for increased intelligence and capacity. That is literally the differentiating factor between us and any other creature, plant, or animal on this earth is that we have the ability to garner and build intelligence and increase our capacity. And I believe that when you keep E under P, you accelerate C, that your growth improves and increases as you struggle and fight to not give away the truths and principles that should underscore your decisions. Maybe harder, a little bit harder, but that's where the becoming is so important. Now, take a look, if you will, at a different score in this formula. This is an interesting one. Here's an 828. Here's a person that's highly motivated by ego, self-gratification, and how they're viewed by the world, highly motivated by money, and has a low to little commu uh, con commitment and motivation to live their, their life in alignment with principles. But what makes this particular formula so dangerous is the high capacity. That is, they're talented, they're smart, but they're not using those talents and abilities and intelligence to actually do the right thing sometimes. They're using that to potentially take advantage of others or to violate truths and principles. And this is a dangerous score. In fact, I'd like to suggest you should run from these. I've worked with these before. I like to hope that I've never been a chronic 828. In my worst moment, maybe I was in a singular moment or a thought, but when this becomes a chronic recurring profile of anyone around you or yourself, I can assure you durable success will flee. This is where short-term success and great typically is the fall of anyone who puts themselves in this formula and profile and believes that it will endure. So that's the EPC formula. It basically is, hey, listen, uh, let's be sure to manage our motives and keep E under P and let's drive up and accelerate the ability and capacity we have. And it was this formula that really, before we even started ASEA, had taken shape in my heart and mind with other colleagues I worked with. And it got to where we just said, this is the formula for success and this is the type of person we want to work around. And when dad wanted to start ASEA early on, and I shared this with him and I said, dad, if we make this the prevailing formula of how we look to attract people, how we communicate, uh, I believe we'll build a company with longer term success. And here we are 10 years later with a field force that I believe collectively profiles very similar to 588. They're talented, capable people that are learning and growing who place principles ahead of their ego and economic motivations. And again, be careful that you don't use this as a sword. You shouldn't go around diagnosing everyone else. I can submit to you that if you do that, you're having your own micro E over P moment. The right thing to do with this is to actually use it as your own diagnostic mirror and simply check in with yourselves, particularly when you're making big decisions in your life or business and say, what are the principles that really drive the outcome of this decision versus just the economic or even ego gratification dynamics? I think you'll make better long-term decisions in doing so. So summarizing that first part of this discussion today is just this notion of manage motives. Never let your ego or economic motivations be greater than your commitment to living in alignment with true principles. That's the summary takeaway. And then the other dimension, of course, is to build yourself. Uh, my dad used to always say to me, you're valued in life in large measure 
to the degree that you make yourself valuable. So work on yourself, do things that will help you to do and be better. Okay, hopefully that resonates with you guys. That's really one of the core, core underpinnings of, of who we are as a company. And uh, let's talk a little bit about this, this seemingly trite statement, alliter alliteration of believe, belong, and become. This is way, way more compelling than maybe some trite corporate maxim or statement that you might hear. There's a lot going on between these words, and it's a true invitation that I think is at the heart of our corporate soul. And I want to show these things not as individual things, but actually highly connected and informing and inspiring of each other. And want to show you the relationship between these three things. So I, I think it's important that, that you understand the power and importance of belief. Perhaps the most dangerous and underutilized belief in the world is that of yourself. It's fascinating to me as a father of six children to see the effect, the profound effect of self-confidence and believing in self and how that can find its expression materially in outcomes in your life. I'm also amazed at how delicate children are and the voices around them, the voices that are allowed to be of some influence to them, that can also affect belief in self. What is it about each one of us individually that erodes belief in self? Where does it start? Can you think of a teacher that might have suggested that you weren't good at a certain subject or math? I always cringe when I think that maybe the people that should love us the most maybe have the greatest amount of impact on hurting our ability to believe in ourselves. That's a great irony of life, is that sometimes those closest to us do the most damage to our own belief in self. I know that uh, believing in yourself is at the central uh, notion of any kind of personal success. And I think it's an important thing that we all have to remember. I've told the story from the stage several times of my youngest son, James, who loves to play basketball. And James uh, actually is a really, really good little player. He's 10 years old, but when he was eight and was starting to play on a little competitive team, a pretty good competitive team, um, he'd get in a game and he, he would just, he'd get the ball and he'd pass it right away. He wouldn't even think about shooting. And uh, as a dad, of course, I wanted to inspire confidence in him. And I'd say, hey, take it to the hoop. You can do this. And he would just get the ball. And it, he might even have an open lane right to the basket, but he just would not take it. And I remember asking him after a game where he was particularly nervous and hypersensitive. You could tell he was very concerned about how he performed and how he showed up. And I said, James, Tell me what you think of when you get the ball, if you're being really honest. And his first response was, I think of passing. And I said, so that's great, but why don't you sometimes think about shooting? Sometimes they pass it to you and you're wide open. And uh, you could tell, and he meant, you know, I don't want to miss. And I don't want the, the coach to, you know, be upset with me. And so the next game, same thing happened. And I watched, and not that I'm taking shot at coach, at the shot at coach's son, partic sons, particularly because I'm somewhat of a coach's son here in this company, but I watched the coach's son who clearly was comfortable shooting in front of his dad. And he, he missed like nine times and made one in the, in the first part of the half of the game. And so I said to James, I said, Hey James, you know, the coach's son was really comfortable shooting a lot and missing. And then I looked at him and I said, I want you to miss. Like, I want you to miss. And I think he was kind of surprised by that. Uh, in essence, what I was saying is you need to miss, like you need to be comfortable missing. And I want to give you the sense that believing in yourself means it's okay to miss. It means I might miss, but I'm going to give this a try. And that could be in life. That could be in any number of things. But a lot of us don't believe in ourselves enough to allow that to happen. If you stop and really process what E.E. E. Cummings is saying in this, you'll sense that notion of you want to miss, right? You want to be okay missing. He says, once we believe in ourselves, we can risk curiosity. Think about that. We can start wondering, in the case of my younger uh, son, James, we can risk missing. I'm curious if I could make it in a game. I'm curious. We can risk wonder. I wonder if I shot or I took it to the basket, what might happen. And spontaneous delight. I saw that spontaneous delight in him. He shot a game-winning shot, not three or four games later, and was never the same again. 
literally every day wakes up and shoots 100 free throws every day. When I pulled out this morning two hours ago to come down to the office, he was shooting in my front driveway. He just nonstop. But now it's delight to him. It's not anxiety. Because what? He believed in himself enough to risk curiosity, to risk wonder, and to risk spontaneous delight or any experience that can reveal the human spirit. Guys, listen, if you're on this call for the first time, we are building an ethos, a corporate soul that enables you to risk curiosity. Have you ever wondered or wondered and been curious about what you could become or do if you were just given the right framework, opportunity, and culture to grow? What about any experience that might reveal your spirit? Does your current job or opportunity reveal the essence of your spirit? Is there something about your own soul that's not finding true expression, but because of work scenarios or the lack of being willing to risk wonder or curiosity or delight about what could happen, you've traded the maybe for the sure thing and just kind of settled in? I believe that the greatest human resource in the world that's underutilized is the human resource. It's not oil, it's not trees, it's not any other natural resource, it's the human resource. And what would the world look like if we stopped feeling like I can't miss? And we started just being very comfortable at risking curiosity, wonder, spontaneous delight, or any experience that could reveal your spirit. I believe ASEA is definitely a place where you can come and miss. We want you to miss here with us. If you stopped and said, what about products? Do I have to have a belief in products to be truly part of this corporate soul? We, we really have a unique story in the marriage between redox and nutrition. Um, the labor and materials dynamics that we've talked about. Dr. Michael shared this with me. I shared this at convention when he said, thinking about the intricate coordinated chemistry in our body. See, I like to think of this as a pair of dancers that are really choreographed. Their every move is designed that complements each other and they can adapt to the change in the music or the dance floor. And all of that is moving in concert in a beautiful way. But if you take one of the partners out of the picture and you just have the female now in some potentially awkward position, right? It doesn't look the same and it's not the same. And he goes, and so that is with redox signaling molecules coupled with good nutritional agents. This is a perfect pairing in unison, managing the intricacies of what we call a healthy, beautiful life. I've learned a lot over the years about the power of cofactoring and coupling in the body. And I think you'd be amazed to think, you know, if you said, why do proteins need cofactors? There's all these interesting couplings that happen in the body. And sometimes I think we miss the power of having both the labor and, labor and the materials, the powerful cofactoring that happens. We have a marvelous uh, a product situation right now. We all know that our Hero uh, Redox supplement product and the Hero Renew 28, these are Hero products. These are mind-bending uh, products that are helping people in ways. We have thousands and thousands of letters that are out there. You can have high confidence in those products. And frankly, it's a story that we want you to know. We, we really ask ourselves, are we building and bringing to bear high impact and high integrity products? And the answer is yes. Uh, I love Disney saying, when you believe in a thing, believe in it all the way. Don't question it, believe in it implicitly. implicitly. And I think belief in the product set is fundamental to your success inside of this enterprise. We have a great company that you can feel confident in. This is our growth curve uh, over the last 10 years particularly the last two years, we're starting to move into the phase of momentum and seeing exponential growth. Uh, we're in the top uh, 50 of world direct selling companies out of a universe of thousands, and we're really growing uh, a great deal. Uh, Chuck likes to suggest that uh, the plane has left the runway and it's no longer on the runway. He says, you know, when it takes forever just to build a plane, it takes a great deal of fuel and energy to get the plane off the ground, the ASEA plane is not on the runway and it's certainly not in the warehouse being assembled. And you can feel confident knowing that it's definitely taking off and elevating. Chuck shared our mission to better people's lives and be a force for good and to really have a vision of becoming the, the world recognized leader in two broad areas, cellular health and redox based technologies. Our goal is to worldwide distribute three things our products, our financial opportunity, and this very culture and ethos I'm talking about today. The essence of me being on this call on a Saturday with all of you 
is that vision, which we want to distribute not just products and financial opportunities, but also this unique culture we have. We've got a strong strategic framework that we use as a company. We have an awesome leadership team that's guiding us around the world. And I think you can feel really, really confident in our compensation plan, the various ways that you might be able to benefit economically from how we get paid, and ultimately this ethos we're talking about today. All of these are fundamental elements of our company that you should feel confident in. Uh, this is a former direct selling news article about our company and where we are as a business. We're getting recognized. I mentioned a moment earlier, we're in the top 44. Last year, we were 77th in the top 100. As of this year, we're 44th in the world. I'm excited to continue to climb that. It's going to get trickier as we get closer to the top of that. But we're simply in this for the long haul and want to continue to see the company grow. The industry is fascinating. I think some people uh, give it a bad rap or think that they think this industry is less than them. There is no one too talented or too good for this industry. I repeat, there is no one too talented or too good for this industry. In fact, this industry is hidden to talent and when talent finds it, they have incredible outcomes in their life, in every dimension of their life. Relationships, travel, world experience, unique international friendships and relationships and teams and economic outcomes that frankly most would trade for. If you look at the foot, National Football League in the United States, it's a $14 million industry. The music industry, 18, 41 in movies, organic foods and products, gaming, which is mind blowing to me, video gaming, 108 billion. Network marketing is a $190 billion industry. It's not on trial and it's not going away. Uh, you can see this in the direct selling news. This is all around the world. It is a fantastic industry to be involved in. What about believing in each other? And this is a big part that kind of leads us to the second part of, of, uh, of our believe, belong, become statement. I don't think there's anything more powerful that you could say to someone than I believe in you. We often say to people, good luck. I think you should trade good luck for I believe in you. I think that should be said to your kids. I think that should be said to people on your teams. We should stop wishing people luck and crossing fingers or break a leg, and we should simply look at people and say, I believe in you. Now, what does believing in someone really suggest? Well, I believe when you believe in each other, it prefigures something, and it prefigures belonging. I don't know of anyone that I feel I belong to more than the person that believes in me someone that I know fundamentally believes in me. This is the concept where I feel that they believe in me and I can believe in myself and I can even miss and not lose favor with that person. Then in that moment, I feel like I belong to them. You see the relationship here then becomes believing in self, in products, in opportunity, in industry, in company, and ultimately in the people on your team almost immediately inspires the notion of belonging. Uh, Mother Teresa said, if we have no peace, it's because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. The belonging is a huge human need. We know that the physiological and safety are the base needs from Maslow's hierarchy, but once you get to that third dimension, love and belonging are a central hierarchy part of the needs that we all have with each other. It ultimately it jumps to esteem and self-actualization, which obviously points us to the becoming but love and belonging are central to human need. And what happens when you believe in each other and you belong to each other? This is a really interesting cascade. It starts with believing, then it moves to belonging. And here's what I've learned is when you belong to each other, you serve each other. This is key. You start to make your all-consuming occupation the success of someone else. You serve. It's not just their financial success, it's their life success. We become the inflection points in other people's lives, and those inflection point moments that we've had some influence over signal a belonging because we've served them. Now, my favorite quote, which I've shared for many years from the stage, I memorized in my mid-20s. I heard it on a book on tape on a Stephen Covey book called First Things First, and I pulled over my car and I wrote it down on a piece of paper and I committed it to memory. This is the quote. Service is the virtue that distinguished the great of all times and which they will be remembered by. It places a mark of nobility upon its disciples. It's the dividing line which separates the two great groups of the world, those who help and those who hinder. 
those who lift and those who lean, those who contribute and those who only consume. How much better it is to give than to receive. Service in any form is comely and beautiful. And then this part is my favorite part. If I could put something on my headstone when I die, it would be these words. To give encouragement, to impart sympathy, to show interest, to banish fear, to build self-confidence, and awaken hope in the hearts of others. In short, to love them and to show it is to render the most precious service. Look at the beautiful words that I'm highlighting in here in green. Help, lift, contribute, give, impart sympathy, show interest, awaken hope. These are the words that really signal belonging. When you are lifted, helped, contributed, when someone shows interest in you, concern, imparts a sympathy to you, loves and shows it to you, you feel that sense of belonging. That is the essence of service. And service, of course, makes our primary focus and emphasis not on ourselves. That points us back to the EP ratio. The principle of service should be our, our higher motivation than simply ourselves. My mom is a lovely influence in my life. I even think mom's on this call. This has long been one of my favorite pictures of my radiant mother, who I have said many times from the stage, and will repeat again for her benefit, mom, if you're listening, that while dad might be the father of ASEA, you are the mother of the ethos of ASEA. Nothing that I've tried to teach from a stage was not inspired or exemplified by the way you lived your life and what you taught to me. My mom would challenge me to memorize poems as a little boy, and the word builder has always been important to me. This was one of the poems she had challenged me to memorize as a, as a little boy. I watched them tear a building down, a gang of men in a busy town, and with a ho heave ho and a lusty yell, they swung a beam and a sidewall fell. And I asked the foreman, are these men skilled, the kind you'd hire if you had to build? And he gave a laugh and said, no indeed, just common labor is all I need. I can easily reckon a day or two what a builder has taken a year to do. And I thought to myself as I went on my way, which of these roles have I tried to play? Am I a builder who works with care, measuring life by the rule and square? Am I shaping my deeds to a well-made plan and patiently doing the best I can? Or am I a wrecker who walks the town, content with the labor of tearing down? How smart my mom was to remind me of the importance of the word builders. I've always had really good friends in my life, people I could spend time with, but I honestly believe it was because I had learned the importance of not tearing others down, <clears throat> but rather learning how to build. How much time, how much effort, how much conscious, focused, deliberate effort are you placing on building others? Do you take the time or do you find yourself engaged in conversation of unskilled labor that can easily in a day or two wreck what builders have taken a year to do? How many of you have children that you've worked so hard to build up only to have Unfortunately, in a weak moment, a friend, a school teacher, someone else in their uh, center of sphere of influence that just said something that was more of a destructive thing than constructive. How many of our children are people have gone through life thinking that they are less than they are because of those simple moments of unskilled labor wrecking what builders have taken years to do? We should all be careful, and certainly if you're part of this ethos, this unique corporate soul, Building each other, regardless of where we are, should be our primary and all-consuming occupation. So I add to this framework, when you believe in each other, you belong to each other. And when you belong to each other, you serve and build one another. That's key. I've said in a couple different settings, in the investment industry, if I said to you, I'm long Coca-Cola stock, I'm long Walmart stock, what does that mean? If I could hear you guys in the crowd right now, somebody would say it means you own the stock. To be long a stock, if I said I'm long Coke, that means I own Coke. Long, to be long, means we own each other. We take ownership and interest in serving and building one another. Can you see why I tell you that beyond the alliteration of the three Bs, 
how important these two things are in relation one to another. Stop and think about the successful people on your teams. Stop and think about anything in life where you've seen success. And I submit to you, you will find evidence of good, deep conviction sets coupled with a deep sense of teaming and belonging. They're absolutely fundamental to success. And of course, all of these things, when you believe in yourself, you believe in what you're is that you're doing, you feel that you can believe in others and they believe in you, and that inspires a sense of belonging, what accelerates at that moment? What accelerates is the becoming. It's absolute and almost guaranteed. We've said for years from the stage, and we mean this, so far you have not seen a Maserati, you have not seen a boat, you have not seen and will not see a mansion here telling you that if you get involved with a SIA, that you can expect an entire socioeconomic shift in your life. That is not what I'm interested in. This statement says the outcome is not income, the outcome is become. We should all remember that we know, I know, and I believe many of you know, very, very wealthy people who have had the income who stopped becoming and who are very, very unhappy despite their bank accounts. The outcome is not income, it's become. One of my early mentors would always say to me, Tyler, never forget the highest reward for a person's toil and labor is not what they get for it, but what they become by it. That labor is shaping us and molding us and transforming us, just like this image suggests to the beautiful butterfly. Hal Elrod said, let today be the day you give up who you've been for who you can become. I really believe this is an important concept that we've got to understand the power and importance of becoming. So important to us that our own recognition magazine is called the Become Magazine. We love to show what people are becoming because of their relationship with our organization. And as I said earlier, self-actualization, which is the essence of becoming, is at the pinnacle, the very peak of this hierarchy of needs for human beings. Once they feel like they belong, then they can move towards esteem and self-actualization. I grew up on the East Coast in New England, in Connecticut. These were the falls where I grew up. I would go outside and play. We would have knee deep leaves all around us. We would rake up big piles of leaves. We would play football in weather that looked just like this outside. It was absolutely beautiful. And I've kind of fallen in love with trees over the years. I'm particularly fascinated by acorns that start these small, small things that grow into such great, mighty trees. And we used to have acorn wars all around our house as kids. These were everywhere. A few years ago for Christmas, I went out to our old hometown and I snuck to our house. No one was there. And on the front yard, I gathered up several acorns and I put them in little glass jars for each of my siblings for Christmas to remind them where we grew up in this beautiful part of New England. I think it's fascinating when you look at tree rings to think about the growth of trees. Trees are such beautiful metaphors for life. There's a story in those tree rings right there. The proximity of each ring to another can tell the story. It can tell the story of drought. It can tell the story of fire or other trauma to the tree. But the one thing that I think it signals that's relevant for all of us is the simple notion of growth on growth. In the investment world, we call this compound growth, which means you continue to grow on the growth. Each of us as human beings are compound growth. Each of us are growing on our prior growth. Each of us have tree rings where we had drought, we had trauma, we had forest fires that we survived. But each of us is growing year after year through the change of the seasons and building on where we started from. What a beautiful metaphor for becoming, I believe. Another poem mom challenged me to memorize as a child that talks about trees, good timber. It says the following, the tree that never had to fight for sun and sky and air and light, stood out in the open plain and always got its share of rain, never became a forest king, but lived and died a scrubby thing. The man who never had to toil to gain and farm his patch of soil, who never had to win his share of sun and sky and light and air, never became a manly man, but lived and died as he began. Good timber does not grow with ease. The stronger the wind, the stronger the trees. The further the sky, the greater the length. The more the storm, the more the strength. By sun and cold, by rain and snow, in trees and men, good timbers grow. And where thickest lies the forest growth, we find the patriarchs of both. 
and they hold counsel with the stars, whose broken branches show the scars of many winds and much of strife. This is the common law of life. What a beautiful, beautiful poem that reminds us that in trees and men, good timbers grow by sun and cold and by rain and by snow. It's not an easy thing. And we should learn that that year over year growth as we put ourselves into the wind and not necessarily in the open plain, always getting our share of rain, the game is to become the forest king and have earned it through the hard work. Please don't think that coming to work at ASEA is a function of where you just land and that it's all gonna work out for you. I want nothing to do with signaling that message. We live in a business that is extreme law of harvest, but it has an incredible leverage point that enables you to harvest much, much more than what you think you are able to after you've put in the time and energy and really worked hard for it. Remember that in trees and men, good timbers grow by sun and cold and rain and snow. That would suggest that the outcome is not income, but maybe we should add one more thing. It's overcome. And of course, this great play on words, the outcome is not income, it's overcome, it's become. And please don't misinterpret me. Of course, it should be income. But if we just simply think the outcome is only income, we will miss the great, great law of life that says that standing out in the open plain and always getting our share of rain really doesn't point us to becoming the forest king, but more likely living and dying the scrubby thing. My dad's a good example of this. Um, he's always said, as I mentioned earlier in the EPC section, Tyler, you're gonna be valued in life largely to the degree that you make yourself valuable. I admire so many things about my dad over the years. He's never one to go backwards. Uh, my mom will tell you much to her chagrin and great pain management that he, uh, it may be wrong, but he's not in doubt. And that's one of the great qualities and terrible qualities of my dad. But to his credit, it was that quality that drove him to start a SIA at age 69. How many of you would invest in a business with a 69 year old retired executive selling salt water from Salt Lake? Think about it, it's crazy. But my dad was always saying, let's go, let's make ourselves more valuable. Let's do something else in this world that helps us to have more value and more impact. My dad is a master of believe, belong, become. Think of a tree, right? The root structure is the belief. Sometimes we don't see this. We have to nurture the believing and the belonging but the becoming part is the easier thing to see. I hate to tell you this, but a lot of times we focus on what we see above the ground. What we don't realize is even the greatest leaders in this companies, the great tall oak trees of this company still need to be nurtured in belief and belonging underneath the ground. Make them no mistake about it. Every human being, regardless of what stature they've reached in life or what status they may have attained, needs these three things to be healthy and to moving forward. Let's all remember that, that some of it's not seen. The beautiful thing about ASEA is you're not the only tree. You have a whole forest of us out there that are right there with you. Our root structures overlap one another. The believing and belonging is right next to one another that enables all of us to show our true colors as we grow. It's actually circular, and it's a powerful framework to think about what life is as we rotate and move in circles. It's almost like a spiral moving up, that the more you believe in something, the more you belong to it, the more you become. And what happens is that inspires greater confidence. As you've seen yourself become, you move to the next level of believing and belonging, and so goes the upward spiral staircase or the tree rings continuing to grow out. Okay, guys. So. Let's summarize what Believe, Belong, Become is really all about. First, believe in yourself, first and foremost. The most wasted resource in the world. It's not oil, it's not any number of natural resources, it's the human resource. You have my permission to discard the negative baggage of your past. Let yourself truly believe that you can do anything that you set your heart and mind to. Please believe in the product, believe in the opportunity, the industry and your company. I'll give you a great secret, conviction sells and emotions buy. When you have deep abiding conviction, people will have an emotional response, not as much to the logic of the product, but greater response to your deep abiding conviction. Belonging to someone and something is one of our most fundamental needs. We belong to each other. We should take care of each other and serve each other and build each other. And please remember, 
If all we do is talk about income, we will kill the corporate soul. I mentioned earlier that people say most companies don't have a soul. Then most companies don't have a soul because they make the outcome just income. Think about that. Most companies lose their, their own corporate soul because they let the outcome simply be income. The profit and loss, the P&L, becomes the soul, which by definition is a skeleton. It's dead. You must inspire the becoming in every person around you. The people that we have around us are the product. It's not just the Redox Supplement product, the Renew 28, the Via Line. It's the people. You should take high priority and focus to your teams to make sure they're becoming. And they will be true to you and stay true and loyal to you as they sense that you're just as interested in their becoming as you are their incoming. It's a really important principle I've learned. Okay, guys, it's a little afternoon my time and we're through two pieces. My goal is to try to get you done here in about 20 or 30 minutes. Hopefully you're not falling asleep on me and hopefully this is helping you some to know a little bit more about our soul. I thank you so much for being here with us. Let's jump into this three questions book. Um, I've got the book here on my desk. I keep a copy here. Some of you may remember the story. This is an amazing story uh, book. Um, written from a short story by Leo Tolstoy, one of the great moral philosophers and writers, of course, in Russian literature. Um, I've spent some time studying Tolstoy. I'm fascinated by him. But just so you know where I first saw this book, my very closest friend when I was 42 years old, I'm going to turn 50 here in uh, early June, my closest friend at age 42, so just about eight years ago, passed away unexpectedly. Uh, from a heart attack, and I went to his home. I was asked to speak at his funeral. I asked if I could spend a few minutes in his personal office at his home as I gathered my thoughts. I was mourning his death and grieving deeply for him, and this book was on the countertop of his desk. I asked his wife about it, and he was uh, serving in his local congregation and had recently done a program for the young men and young women. These would have been kids between 14 and 18 years old and had read this story to them. And after having read it there in his office, not without some great emotion, I made a, a commitment to myself that I would teach these principles to respect and honor him, but also to remind all of us that these are the very essence of our ethos. So if you will, I want you to become a little child today for just a minute, and I'm going to read to you a story here uh, called The Three Questions. It tells of a little boy named Nikolai who wasn't always really sure the right way to act. He, he said he wanted to be a good person, but he just wasn't always sure the best way to do it. And he had friends, the monkey, the dog, and the crane there, and, and they all wanted to help. And he said to them, if I could only find the answers to my three questions, I'd, I'd always know what to do if I could just find those answers. Here are the three questions. When is the best time to do things? Who's the most important one? And what's the right thing to do? So he asked his friends the first question, hey guys, when's the best time to do things? And the crane said, you got to plan in advance. Now listen to the egocentricity of these responses. A bird has great, great bird's eye view and can see the future a little differently. So he says plan in advance. The monkey who's got a coconut falling down to hit him on the head says you got to watch and pay close attention. Clearly he's not doing that. So a little bit of hypocrisy there. And then the, the dog, of course, coming from a political pack says you need a pack to help you know. Okay, next question. So who's the most important one? The dog politically responds, the ones who make the rules. The monkey, who just got clocked in the head with a coconut, says those who know how to heal the sick. And the crane, egocentrically, kind of says, you got to do it like me. I can fly. I'm the most important one because I can get closest to heaven. And what's the right thing to do? Well, flying, of course, what I do. The monkey, of course, is saying, just have fun and quit worrying about stuff. And the political dog says fighting. Well, you might imagine the little boy Nikolai wasn't super excited with their answers, didn't feel right to him. So he hiked up into the mountains to see the old turtle, Leo, where he lived all alone. He got there, Leo was working in his garden and said to him, I have three questions I came to ask for your help. Hey, when's the best time to do things? Who's the most important one? And what's the right thing to do? And it was then that he said, hey, you know, you're probably tired. Let me help you. And the turtle sat down on the rock and gave him the shovel and thanked him for the help. And just then a storm arose and Nikolai heard a cry from across the bridge. He ran down the path 
and he found a panda whose leg had been injured by a fallen tree. He picked the panda up and carried her to Leo the turtle's house. They made a splint for her leg with a stick of bamboo and got her settled. And when she came to and woke up, she said, where am I and where is my child? And just then Nikolai realized there was a baby and ran out of the cottage down the path. The storm was raging. He pushed against the wind and the rain and ran further to the forest. And there he found the panda's child, cold and shivering on the ground. Panda was wet and scared but alive, and so he carried her inside and made her warm and dry, and he laid her in her mother's arms. This watercolor is my favorite picture of the whole thing. Leo smiled when he saw what the boy had done. Well, the next morning, everything was well with the world. The birds were singing, the sun was out. Panda's leg was healing nicely. She thanked the little boy, Nikolai, for saving her and her baby from the storm. And at that moment, the dog and the monkey and the bird came, Sonia, Gogol, and Pushkin. They arrived to make sure that everyone was doing okay. And uh, Nikolai said, I still don't have the answer to my questions to Leo before he left. And he said, you know what? Yesterday, if you hadn't helped and stayed to help me dig my garden, you would have never heard the pandas cry for help in the storm. Therefore, the most important time was the time you spent digging the garden. The most important one at that moment was me. And the most important thing to do was to help me with my garden. Later, when you found the injured panda, the most important time was the time you spent mending her leg and saving her child. The most important ones were the panda and her baby. And the most important thing to do was to take care of them and make them safe. And then, of course, the great moral of the story and answer. There is only one important time, and the time is now. The most important one is always the one you're with, and the most important thing is to do good for the one who is standing at your side. For these, my dear boy, are the answers to what's most important in this world, and then this beautiful conclusion. This is why we are here. This morning, I drove past a care facility, an elderly care facility. And there was a sign out in front that said, we love our hero staff. My mind started to think about a good friend of mine whose dad is currently fighting for his life and has been for three weeks with the virus in Hollywood, the Los Angeles area. And he told me that the 41-year-old ICU doctor has now contracted the disease, trying to help and save everyone else, and is battling for his life at age 41. You stop and think about these three questions and the great heroes in intensive care units like that around the globe, and particularly in those spots here that have been most hard hit. And it's absolutely amazing to me that they suit up every day and just like firemen walking into a bur burning building that's gonna collapse on 9-11, many of them are walking right into the greatest peril of their lives, but to do what? And that is to answer and live these three questions. The most important time is now, the most important one is the one that they're with and around, and the most important thing for them to do is to do good for those that are around them. Isn't it safe to say that if we simply lived these three questions professionally and personally with great intent that our corporate soul would be healthy with just that as our ethos? If we simply said our ethos is the most important time is now, the most important one is the one you are with, and the most important thing to do is to do good for the one by your side. If we literally just lived that, can you imagine what a company and corporate soul that would be? What if a country, a nation, an entire world would simply live these three simple questions. I think there's a reason why this comes from the great moral philosopher, Leo Tolstoy, who would always say that the greatest evidence of truth is both simplicity and clarity. And I think this is a very true principle, definitely a big part of what I believe should be our ethos. So remember guys, when is the best time to do things? Do it now. If you're gonna do this business, do it now. If you're going to share this product, do it now. Don't sit around thinking about thinking about or talking about talking about. Do it now. 
And if you're going to do the most important one or focus on the most important one, it's the one you're with. And that might be someone serving you dinner at a restaurant six months ago. It might be someone you meet in public transportation at an airport. It might be someone you meet at a meeting. Could be your very children when you're at home and you got your phone in your hand and they're needing you to put that down and focus on them. The most important one is the one you're with. And then what should you do? Do right by the one you're with. Think about them and what you can do to help them, whether that's digging in the garden for an old turtle that's tired or carrying a panda's child in that's lost her baby in a storm. You do good for the one who's standing at your side. What an amazing book and story that is. Can you imagine how I felt that day as I was reading this book in the office of my recently deceased friend? Uh, this stays on my uh, desk here in my office as a reminder to me of him. And I honor him, uh, love him very much for what he's taught me over the years. I challenge each of you guys to give some consideration to what that book might mean for you. Certainly more than a kid's book. I think it should be called an adult book for all of us. Okay, last thing I wanted to share with you guys today. You've been great. I wish I was in a room with all of you and could see your smiling faces. Uh, let's cover Ubuntu and what this is all about. Um, you know, my mom forwarded to me many years ago an email about uh, a, a sociologist that was studying a South African culture and lined up a group of kids uh, from South Africa in a village, in a remote village there, and uh, put a basket of fruit at one far end uh, away from the kids and told them that he was going to blow a whistle and they could all run to the basket and the first ones to get there could get the fruit. And the way the story read was... Uh, that he blew the whistle and the children all grabbed each other's hands and actually just started walking. No one was rushing or running to the basket of fruit. And they sat around the basket, took one apple out and took a bite and handed it to the next person so that everyone had a bite until that apple was finished and then they grabbed another. And the sociologist ran down and said, guys, I don't think you understood the test. You could take as much as you wanted if you got here first. And one of the boys said, how could we be happy if one of us is sad? And then he said, Ubuntu. Now, when my mom sent me this email and forwarded it to me, I sat and thought about it for a long time. And I started to research, well, what does Ubuntu mean? And Ubuntu translated roughly into English means I am because we are. What a powerful, powerful concept. Uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe a little more than that, I went to, a little less than that actually, I went to the Europeans incentive trip to South Africa. First question I asked my uh, cab driver as I was leaving the Johannesburg airport and heading to a hotel was to tell me what Ubuntu meant. And he proceeded to tell me that it means humanity. It means recognizing our need for each other. And I said, is it I am because we are? He said, that's well said. That's what we mean when we say Ubuntu. The Reverend Desmond Tutu said this, Ubuntu speaks of the very essence of being human. If we say, hey, so-and-so has Ubuntu, then you're generous, you're hospitable, you're friendly, you're caring, you're compassionate. You actually share what you have. It says my humanity is caught up and is inextricably bound up in yours. We belong in a bundle of life and we say a person is a person through other persons. People with Ubuntu in South Africa will leave food on their porch because they don't know if someone coming along to their village may need food and water. There's a certain awareness that I am because we are. He continues to say that they're available to others. If you have Ubuntu, you're available to others. You affirm others. You don't feel threatened that someone is good or able because you have a proper self-assurance that comes from knowing that you or he or she belongs in a greater whole. We are only diminished when others are humiliated or diminished, when others are tortured or oppressed or treated as if they were less than who they are. Think about what he's saying here. What a beautiful philosophy that is, uh, should prevail in the world right now, which says, I'm not threatened. This isn't a zero-sum game. Someone else gets recognized, it doesn't mean that I'm less than. I have just as much proper self-assurance that I belong in a greater whole. I'm only diminished when someone else is diminished or humiliated. What an amazing awareness uh, to others that points to this notion of belonging. So the last 
principle of our ethos I wanted to share and challenge you guys to consider is Ubuntu. None of you will be recognized on a stage without others doing something to help you grow. And when you turn your all-consuming occupation back to their success, you're living Ubuntu just as much as you might have been when you were recognized. None of us should feel that sense of being less than. We shouldn't watch others succeed. I'm a little bit anti certain social media dynamics because I think they would say I am because I am. I think we should be out reminding everyone that I am because we are, and we should be maybe drawing a little bit less attention to ourselves, but being aware that others are good and drawing as much attention to others as well. These are beautiful principles. I hope you agree. It simply says that no one exists in isolation. We have interconnectedness, all of us do, and what we do is affecting the whole world. None of us are gonna reach any height of achievement without the support and help of others. Guys, listen, I hope that you've gotten something out of today's session of just taking a look at some of these elements. Uh, you know, the ASEA ethos with these different dimensions, we've certainly gone through a few of them. This is the full framework of all these different pre presentations. And as I said, we focused today in summary on keeping ego and economic motivations in check, making sure that principles are elevated in our decision making and how we execute things in life, and then building our capacity. We talked a long time about the power of believing, that believing in self and product and company and industry and opportunity as well as in each other promotes a unique form of belonging. That belonging, when we realize, means we serve and lift and build each other, enables accelerated becoming. It's an incredible concept. The three questions I just finished reading with you guys, most important time is now, the most important one is the one you're with, and the most important thing and the right thing to do is to do good to the one standing at your side. And lastly, this beautiful principle that says, I know that I am only because we are. I have a responsibility to others and I must live true to that responsibility that we are together. When I think about this ethos, I like to think about the intersection of three things. Our ethos is really heavily focused on how are you seeing and treating yourself? That could speak to how you see and treat yourself from an ego perspective. It could speak to how do you believe in yourself? Do you really have a confidence in yourself? Do you see yourself as I am because I am? What about how you see and treat others? Um, there's a, several other parts of this. Perhaps Karen will invite me back for another session and we'll do the other parts of, of the ethos, but a lot of them speak to how we see and treat other people. And then you might be surprised to know that it's also inclusive of how you see and treat this opportunity. It's not just the humanity of seeing and treating yourself and others correctly. It's also realizing that if you've been presented with this opportunity, you have a stewardship. You're not here for yourself. You're here to share the ASEA products and opportunity and culture with others that might need it. I've long said that perhaps the single greatest act of friendship you ever extend to someone will be the sharing of ASEA with them. I would submit to you if I opened this line up and we could hear from everyone on this call, there are many people on this call right now that would say the single greatest act of friendship that they might have ever had in their life was when someone on this call spoke to them about joining and participating with us in ASEA. That may seem like hyperbole to you, it is not. I have heard it time and time again. We are making a huge difference in the world. Our products impact people, our culture impacts people, our financial opportunity impacts people. And that's the essence of the center of these three circles that for me is the ASEA ethos. So I thank you guys for giving me some time here. I'm particularly grateful for my parents who have uh, done so much to get ASEA off the ground. My dad's vision and drive, my mother's good heart and, and uh, her being the mother of this ethos, she doesn't probably agree with that. She'd probably diminish that, but that's the, the, the gospel truth. I would tell you guys that I love my family. I'm particularly grateful to my wife, Allison, and my children for their support along the way. Two of my boys are married, and when kids get married, they have babies. I have grandson, Henry. He's at my house right now. Uh, I woke up this morning, and he was crawling around on bed with me, and we were laughing. Uh, what a joy family is. I'm so thankful for my family. It seems to be growing and expanding. I love trying to live this ethos in my own home where sometimes it's the hardest to live as well as bringing it here to ASEA. Guys, I hope that you'll give some thought to how you might be able to live this ethos not only in your personal life, 
but I believe that the great contrasts of the world are when we're living in a way that the world's moving away from. We need to inspire this type of humanity and corporate soul and individual soul to the people we meet and talk to. One of the great secrets, I'll give you a great secret, don't try to convince or change anybody. Just share your beliefs and share what you're doing and honor their ability to make a choice for themselves. Uh, I'll stop the share for just a minute, share my last uh, couple minutes with you guys on the screen here. Bear with me. Uh, so I wanna say thanks uh, for taking some time on a Saturday with me. I hope you'll give some thought to how this might help you. Uh, we're not perfect. It's always dangerous for someone like me as a founder and chairman of a company to start extolling these kinds of virtues and it puts you on a pedestal that's easy to knock off. You can hang with me for a month and you'll see plenty of times when I haven't lived the ethos perfectly. But I will tell you this, I'm unapologetic for teaching it. I think if it's true, you can teach it. And I certainly am committed to trying every week to get better at it. When we make mistakes, which we undoubtedly have and will continue to do, I hope that you as field uh, leaders will also feel comfortable helping us know we've made a mistake and doing it constructively. And we'll do the same and let's all kind of help each other to be the very best we can possibly be. What I'm grateful for is we have a shot. We, we have a shot at having a corporate soul. Uh, we started with it. I know a lot of companies that are desperately trying to engender it way ex post facto. And you and I both know if it's there early on and from the beginning and it's authentic and real, it's going to have far reaching impact. And it's really, really hard to reboot a corporate soul if you lost it. So help me to keep this corporate soul. If anything I've said today inspires you or is of some resonance to you, then let's go out and try to live it the best we can. I don't think we need to boil the ocean. I think we need to boil a cup of water. We just need to do our part along the way. And if all of us are trying our best to live these kinds of principles, the world will in fact be a better place and our mission to better people's lives and be a force for good in that world will have been met. Thanks, Karen, for letting me join all of you. And thanks to all of you for allowing me to share some of these principles that are so near and dear to my heart. We hope if you're listening for the first time, you'll give serious consideration to joining us on this movement. And if not, we wish you all the great success in the world. And thanks for sharing a little bit of time with us.